Thank you, Dr. Chase. Uh, yeah, this is pretty amazing. So, um, first, Commissioner, you said there's a disclaimer you want to make? A disclaimer. But first, thank you for pulling this together. I appreciate everyone coming out late on a Monday night um, and on such short notice. But yes, my disclaimer is that my views represent my own views and not necessarily those of the Securities and Exchange Commission or my fellow commissioners, which may make some of you want to leave because now it's not worth as much, right? But that is what I have to tell you. Okay, so um, a brief intro, and I've, I've read up a lot on the commission, but I found this, uh, these couple sentences to be kind of fun. So it says, the SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce became a meme last year after dissenting on an agency decision to reject a new Bitcoin exchange traded fund. The industry immediately saw one of its own and bestowed an affectionate nickname, Crypto Mom. <laughs> Pierce, a former lawyer, is seen as the most crypto-friendly of the SEC's five commissioners and someone who will fight crypto's battles for mainstream acceptance and champion its fundamentally anti-government ethos. So that's a pretty, is that a pretty accurate? Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, first of all, um, maybe I better walk that back a bit. I have, to, I have to say that I'm not a proponent of any particular technology um, or any particular product or company, but what I did see in this technology was um, a chance for us to think at the SEC and in the government more broadly about how we, how we handle innovation. And um, so this has been a good test case, um, particularly because it tends to bring, to get, bring together people who are not used to interacting with the SEC, um, with us as regulators, and that's not always a great combination. And so um, they don't understand why it is we're trying to do what we try to do, and we don't understand what they're trying to do, and we sort of have all sorts of preconceptions about what the industry is. And so I wanted to say, hey, we as regulators need to realize that there's value to innovation. And there's, there, we can sometimes stand in the way of innovation. And that's OK if we have a good reason for doing it. But if we stand in the way of innovation simply because it's new and it's scary to us, that isn't OK. And so I wanted us to take a more measured approach um, and try to work with people in the community to try to figure out if our rules do need to change, how should those rules change in a way that will make them able to do what they are trying to do um, in a way that conforms with our securities laws. Wow, and what did the other four members of the SEC say about that? No. <laughs> I'm still working on it. No, I should be a little unfair because I think we made some progress and the, the agency has actually um, set up a, a, a place um, on the internet, FinHub it's called, um, and that's a group within the SEC as well, a group of staff that focuses a lot of time um, on this asset class. And so we're encouraging people to come talk to us. We actually have people at the agency who are, who are fairly knowledgeable about this space um, and really open doors. They really do want to talk to people. So I think we have made some progress. It's not as fast as I would want. In fact, just this past week, um, I issued another dissent on another Bitcoin exchange traded product that didn't get through um, and expressed some frustration that we haven't moved faster. But I think there, there are signs of progress and I'm hopeful um, that we can continue to make progress at the commission my, my colleagues' intentions are very good. They're trying to protect investors. They're trying to protect the markets. And that's what, what's driving them. So I think we just need to reach them um, and explain to them that we can both protect investors and the markets and also allow innovation to move forward. All right. And I would like to introduce our two other panelists to my left, Mr. Ken. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Mr. <laughs> yes, Ken. Uh, so, uh, my name is Ken Herzer, and I started my career, I have to say, at the SEC in the Enforcement Division back in the late 90s. Uh, Schindler and I were actually talking about this before we came up here, and I, that was actually one of the best parts of my career, uh, very rewarding. Uh, since then, I uh, got into private practice, 
And these days, I handle all uh, sorts of uh, securities litigation, SEC investigations with the Enforcement Division, uh, and represent um, you know, various different founders in SEC investigations, litigation, uh, and uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency companies. Got interested in it uh, about three or so years ago, and then when just generally the technology kind of fascinating, uh, one of the many amazing disruptive uh, sort of technologies out there. And then when the commission took an interest, I thought, oh, well, now there's actually a good excuse for me to learn more about it because it relates to my job. So that's uh, kind of my, my uh, short elevator speech. Terrific. And how do you interface with Larry on the corporate side? And so the great thing about having people like Larry is that as a litigator, uh, you know, Larry and I deal with the same set of regulations and laws, but we come at them differently. So Larry often deals with the community on, on the formation side, and I deal with things sort of after they've gone wrong. So people generally like to see Larry, they don't like to see me. But it's, it's nice because we can bounce things off of each other to, particularly for me, to, to sort of find out sort of what is actually going on out there in the community, how do people do things, and then um, we both interact with FinBo, uh, which is great. And, and actually, I want to uh, give a big compliment to the commissioner and the FinBo staff, and I know there are sort of individuals throughout regional offices who are now kind of specializing. I think that's fantastic. I would love to see, like, you have the asset. Uh, management unit, the FCPA unit, I would really, and, you know, uh, appreciate being able to interact with somebody who specializes within all the regional if that ever comes about. Very cool. And we do have, I mean, I should say, there are people in our San Francisco office who are pretty knowledgeable about this space as well and pretty engaged. And John Jeffries on the left from Cypher Trips. Hi, thank you. My name is John. People call me JJ. We, uh, are a blockchain analytics company. We specialize in cryptocurrency intelligence. We're originally funded by the DHS, really to track terrorists and drug dealers. Um, but a couple of years ago, anti-money laundering became the focus of the cryptocurrency space, uh, much to the chagrin of some. Uh, but we really feel like it's an essential element to make cryptocurrency safe, both for investors and for people who hold large amounts. So, you know, tens. Tends not, not in terms of libertarian, like getting robbed. Uh, so oftentimes, people who once didn't believe in our mission, uh, they start to understand it. But really, what we're about is making the, the cryptocurrency uh, ecosystem safe, both for investors and for consumers. And we're focused on that in many different ways. In part, a big part of what we're doing as well is working very closely with some of the largest banks in Europe and in the United States. Uh, to help them understand and perceive and mitigate the potential risks associated with cryptocurrency, uh, money laundering risks, and other sorts of risks uh, that crypto may face for them. So hopefully we're enabling them to uh, both understand and grapple with those risks and feel comfortable uh, managing and monitoring those risks so they can accept crypto companies and customers. Yeah, and one of the big questions I think that you know, I know Larry and I were talking about two years ago during the ICO craze. By the way, um, who here's who here's here for the ICO pitches? Oh, no. That's not that. So, um, so during the ICO craze, um, I think there was a lot of ambiguity about what is a digital asset. Is Bitcoin, you know, uh, uh, an animal or a bird? Or, you know, is it Ethereum? And you know, there are all these conversations about that. What do you all think is the current state of digital assets? Is there any more clarity today than there was a year ago or, or two years ago about what is what and what's regulated how? I'm sure everybody wants to hear from the commissioner about this, so I'll, I'll make mine short. I, I, I think there is more clarity, certainly, than there was. But as it stands today, it, it is very difficult to advise a client where the, you know, uh, the guardrails are because we're you know operating off of what is essentially enforcement precedent and having been an enforcement attorney I know that there's a lot that goes into a you know a settled OIP some of which never becomes public and so it's, it's hard to read the tea leaves and advise clients sometimes I, I do think that when it comes to what's a digital asset versus security there is there is more clarity um, but obviously, we're 
still striving for more clarity? Uh, I think that there's increasing clarity. I think, um, you know, actually, there's a, a page in the, the uh, cryptocurrency report that's on most of your seats uh, that was inspired by Hester's, one of her talks in uh, Virginia, where she said that, you know, that, that in fact, the regulators believe there would be clarity. And I feel that, you know, sometimes people in the space uh, confuse uh, not liking some of the regulations with lack of clarity. Um, so what we do is we try to figure out and enumerate which organizations in the USG actually regulate which parts of the uh, of the cryptocurrency space. And we work to, as both of the other speakers have mentioned, uh, FinHat is very open to engage. Uh, we brief them regularly, and they help me uh, analyze that and produce that that uh, little chart that shows which uh, you know which of the entities are managed are regulated. So a great variation across digital assets, if we want to use that term. Um, and and so it's it's really hard to lump things together and figure out one regulatory framework that works for everything. Um, so I think we're still struggling to provide clarity. And often when we do try to provide clarity, um, it ends up being a facts and circumstances type of clarity, which is, you know, here are some of the things you ought to think about. And that can be frustrating for people who want, you know, just tell me which side of the line is this on. Um, but that's just not typically how our securities laws work in the U.S. We're, we're much more, the, the way that our securities laws were written was that, you know, we identified certain things as being definitely securities. And then we had this catch-all category for investment contracts. Because we wanted to make sure that people weren't doing an end run around the securities laws and, and doing something that was essentially a securities offering um, by calling it something else. And so that's where it can be very difficult. And, and that's why the guidance that's come out of the agency has been so hard to follow. And I agree with you that you know a lot of the guidance, much to my displeasure, has come through the, the, the um, enforcement actions that we brought. And that means people are trying to piece together and they're trying to read what those mean. And that can be very difficult because often there are pieces of those enforcement actions um, that are important, but it might not be clear that they're important. And so you might jump to a conclusion that um, is not warranted because you don't know the underlying, uh, what's underlying the enforcement action. Well, Commissioner, you made news not too long ago with this clarity around safe harbor making that a little more understandable um, for the industry. Um, and obviously it's top of mind for everyone. Um, does that mean that, um, I guess one of the questions is, what do you mean by network maturity and decentralization of management, if you can give any more clarity about that? And does the safe harbor really mean that companies have three years to really try out their stuff and you know, there's not going to be enforcement during that time. I think even though there's clarity, there's still kind of, what does that really mean sort of stuff? Well, and I should clarify that I, I put out a safe harbor um, proposal, which is my own proposal. And so I'm one of now four commissioners, which means that I need to convince my colleagues before this proposal, proposal or anything like it would actually be put out as a formal SEC um, document. But my theory was that after talking to people in this space, it seemed like there was a, there was a, a gap between um, regulation and decentralization. So if, if, if you're trying to start a project and you're, maybe you got venture capital funding to get the project going and then you're ready to launch the tokens out into the wild, um, there's a lot of fear that when you do that, that launch will be a securities offering. And so my reaction to that is, well, maybe we need to find a way for people to feel comfortable in releasing the tokens under an exemption that works for tokens specifically. So understanding that um, one of the reasons that you would want to cover token offerings with the securities laws is to make sure that people who are buying the tokens get the information they need to make good <coughs> token purchase decisions. Um, and so we tried to tailor the information that was required in this exemption to meet the needs of people who would be buying tokens. What would they want to know? 
Um, and then we say, all right, so you, you claim the exemption and then you've got a three year period during which you are exempt from the securities laws except for the anti-fraud laws. So if you get up there and you uh, lie about what your plans are, then you're subject to a securities action. But you're in general able to operate without having to worry about the securities laws. So as long as you're a legitimate project, you've got three years to try to get your project um, from you know off the ground and into a decentralized or um, functioning token stage. Yeah, yeah uh, and actually one question I had is, it looks like in section uh, F, that you envision that there will be entities that have already, you know, issued tokens under the exemption. Um, and one thing that we've been trying to figure out, and was just interested if you've given any thought to, is you know, what about those pre-existing uh, entities, right, that have already issued uh, tokens and perhaps some under exemption, some for consumptive use, and they're somewhere along that three-year spectrum now, right? Um, we're just trying to figure out oh, would, would the rule apply retroactively to them? Where would they start in the cycle? Have, have you given any thought to how to treat those sorts of promoters? Well, I think that you have to think about whether those sales prior to your claiming the exemption and starting the three-year clock ticking, you've got to think about whether those sales were done pursuant to a, an exemption. But if you, if you conducted those sales pursuant to an exemption, then you can rely on the safe harbor, as I envision it, to then do future token um, distribution. So some, I think projects would have to consider on a, on a you know, one by one basis whether or not they could take advantage of that, whether it would be meaningful. But one, one thought that I had was that some, you know, for example, if you've used Reg A to get your tokens out there, you might still decide that this safe harbor could be useful to you um, in terms of getting wider distribution of the tokens and allowing the tokens to, um, to trade more freely. Um, but again, I should say that part of the reason that I wanted to put this out is I wanted people to give me feedback so that we can refine this, so that if, if there is a time um, which I remain optimistic, but if there's a time where we can get other people on board with it, it'll be pretty refined by that time so that it'll be able to move along faster um, towards finality. And it also seems like a lot of these regulations have been aimed from the issuing side of the, uh, of the market. Um, and there hasn't been a whole lot really around marketplaces, exchanges, um, that side of the market, the kind of liquidity side. Um, is that an SEC area, or is it a FinCEN, or a different part of the government? And I think also, if maybe you could clarify kind of where the uh, where the um, lanes are between who does what and how. It'd be awesome to understand that's, how that's the That's a different big question, ones. right? That's yeah. a $50 million question, I think. Um, so exchanges are certainly in our, our um, bailiwick when they're when what you're exchanging is a security. And so it all comes back to are these things securities or are they not securities? If they are securities, then you have to think about um, the, the transactions have to occur either on an exchange or an ATS, um, and which is essentially an exchange light um, that's registered with us. Now under my proposal, if you had tokens trading, they wouldn't have to trade on a registered exchange, you'd have to trade on an exchange that did take into account and did perform the uh, know your customer requirements, those kinds of things. And so, so I mean, that's an area where that falls within FinCEN's bailiwick. Um, and FinCEN has been really active in this space because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of entities involved in this space are, are money transmitters, which are then subject in the jurisdiction. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Since sure, when I, you know, when I think about uh, exchangers or people who are in, in the space as vast as you will, um, I think of really two different types of regulation. One is the regulation of the underlying security itself and you know whether or not it's being manipulated, whether or not there's wash trading going on. And then the other side is whether or not the money is being laundered. 
and if it's being, if the funds are being used or if the exchange is being used uh, to launder illicit funds. And so on that side, uh, the regulation has really accelerated. So we've seen uh, FinCEN come out and say quite a lot of things recently. Um, the Treasury Department came out and said that they're going to force uh, transparency upon the market. Uh, internationally, we see in the EU, they, they launched their AML D5 on January 10th and started taking action against the first six countries for not implementing it. And simultaneously, uh, all the OECD countries have to implement uh, the so-called travel rule, which uh, is much like SWIFT type functionality, which requires exchanges exchange the information about both the both of the participants in the transaction prior to committing that transaction. So that's created quite a stir within the space, and we've actually created an open source effort to try to solve that. Um, and we're working very closely with the Financial Action Task Force as well in. Europe, uh, Dave, our CEO, was just uh, presenting to them the progress that we've been making, and uh, they're on quite a hard deadline. So the deadline for implementation is June 16th, and uh, it's pretty better. Yeah, and it's interesting too. I mean, I've been involved with a bunch of projects. Um, there were utility tokens, which I guess in the US don't really exist anymore, uh, security tokens, and I've actually spent a lot of time in random countries like Malta. Liechtenstein and Switzerland, that their purview is that, you know, this is a whole net new thing. And um, one um, government person over there said to me, think about if we regulated the airline industry based on rules that were written in the 1920s before there was an airline industry. Like, what would the air travel space look like today? So with that background, do you accept, reject, or somewhere in the middle that, you know, crypto and tokens are a whole net new thing that maybe don't fit neatly into, you know, 100 year old securities laws or these sorts of things? And if, if you have a blank slate, do you think there should be a whole new regulatory regime around blockchain, or is it just, it's not that different? Well, I mean, I think there, there's definitely room for some adjustment of our securities laws to accommodate some of the unique features. Um, I will push back a bit because I think some of the some of the problems in this space have looked a lot like problems that we see in other spaces. You know, it's people going to raise money and lying about what they're what they're planning to do with it and running off with the money and that looks an awful lot like a, a one of the mill securities fraud to me. Um, and it seems appropriate for us to use our securities laws to police that kind of conduct or to, to respond to that kind of conduct. You know, on the other hand, I think there's some unique problems with regulating crypto under the securities laws because um, you may start out, you know, running a what looks very much like a traditional offering, and then you have these tokens which were wrapped in an investment contract. At the, you know, that's what made it an offering. But then once the tokens are being used in a network, it, they look nothing like securities to me. Um, and so at that point, does it make sense to use the securities laws? That seems like it's a bit more of a stretch. And that's where I think people, um, it, 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 people disagree on what the right approach is at that point. And, and so um, that's where I think we need to think more creatively. So uh, I'll just pipe in because you brought up Malta. So we provide the uh, risk management infrastructure for the countries of Malta and Bermuda, and they're effectively implementing sandboxes. So they're creating a little safe haven for crypto companies to play and experiment. At the same time, we give them the tools to be able to, man to measure and monitor the relative risk of each of those. So for instance, if an ICO is bringing money in from fraudulent sources or from theft or other sorts of scams, they can highlight that and know, you know, what the underlying risk of each of those entities operating within their jurisdiction is. So uh, one question I have, Commissioner, uh, you know, the, the way that you've set up the proposed rule, the, the two key factors seem to be, um, you know, for network maturity are decentralization and, and full functionality. And the way I read it, I mean, I read it wrong, was that it was a disjunctive test. <coughs> you either or. Um, 
And then, to me, they're both complicated, but the functionality, the yardstick, sounds like particularly complicated. And, and you even commented that right now you're purposely leaving it um, with a little wiggle room because you need to get you know, consensus from the community. Have you gotten any feedback from the community about what people think generally about, for instance, how many apps should be running on the <coughs> platform, what sort of um, utility should actually be implemented to meet the ultimate three-year goal? Focus more on the decentralization and told me that I need to do um, some more work in terms of defining what that is. And you know, part of part of why I didn't think that that was as necessary is because I, I feel like if you've got three years, um, <coughs> that it's much likelier that you're going to know which side of the line you're on. One of the problems we've run into is that because we're, we're judging from an enforcement perspective, these token projects just at the time when they're launching, and so it's really too early to tell whether, I mean, they're probably not decentralized, but it's too early to really assess functionality because you haven't, it's not in enough people's hands for it to really be used yet, and so we, we have trouble with that. I think it's much easier to assess that if you have a three-year period where the network is up and running and people are actually using this. Um, one reason, too, for adding the functionality test, and you know, this, you know, the safe harbor is trying to do multiple things. So one of the things it was trying to do is capture this idea of a decentralized network where you've got the token as the point of the realm in that network. But the other thing it was trying to capture is the kind of thing where you might have a company that sets up um, some sort of token-based economy, right? And so we had a couple examples with some no-action letters um, that the SEC issued. A no-action letter is just, it's a, a letter that comes out that says, hey, if you do what you tell us that you're going to do, we're not going to bring an enforcement action. We're not going to recommend an enforcement action against you. Um, and so there were two. One of them was for Pocket Full of Quarters, which is a gaming token and the other was for um, a, a token that would be used for um, private jet um, flights. And so those are run by a company. And I just, to me, when I saw those no action letters come out, they come out at the staff level, not at the commission level. I just shook my head and I said, it's not helpful that we're issuing letters about things that clearly are not securities. Why should, because we put conditions on them when we issue those letters. And um, so effectively, we're constraining the ability of these companies to run token networks in, in ways that they might want to run them. And so I wanted the safe harbor to also be able to cover those kinds of situations. And that's what I was primarily thinking of um, in terms of, you know, that's where the functionality would come in and you couldn't rely on decentralization in that kind of circumstance. You know, and that also brings up the whole realm of DeFi decentralized finance, right? So if John and I are doing an exchange, you know, where does the KYC take place, for example? Where does the custody take place? Is there, you know, is the network a holder? You know, that's one kind of question. The other thing I was wondering about too was were all these lending, crypto lending things, right? Where you put up your, your crypto's collateral. How do you, I mean, clearly DeFi is a thing and um, you know, you talk about decentralization, but you know, in essence, peer-to-peer -peer economies. What? How does the SEC think about you know these sorts of services where you may not have a centralized entity that could do some of these functions that you know that you all re require today? Well, I think it does raise interesting questions when you've got these peer-to-peer -peer kind of transactions, but some of that is really not going to fall within our purview. Um, is my guess. If it's truly peer-to-peer -peer and there's no intermediate, intermediary in there, if there is an intermediary even playing a small role, I think that intermediary better be very careful to make sure it's complying with our, with our rules because it most likely would be caught up in our rules. Um, but again, if it's just peer-to-peer -peer and neither of the peers is in the business of, of um, engaging in these kinds of transactions, then it's less likely it would be covered. But I urge anyone who's, who's thinking about setting up something like this to come talk to the SEC, again, to get a sense of, of where you fall, because 
it's there are nuances and complexities and it's pretty dangerous to just assume um, that something will fall within our securities laws. And as a follow-on to that, I mean, DeFi exchanges to me seem pretty interesting. And like, who controls the order book? And where do the funds fall? I don't know. Uh, JJ, have you had any interfaces with uh, de decentralized exchanges? Sure. We um, we actually support the finance chain, so we provide anti-money laundering uh, screening for the finance chain and the other tokens that. So I had a question actually going off of the exchange piece, and I think you said in your speech when you were putting out a proposed rule that we would be surprised that you were saying part of the rule would, would require liquidity, and we were surprised because <laughs> it's normally an indicia of you know security. Um, one question, and and this kind of melts off of what Mark said is, um, have you given any thought about how you know a promoter? should go about um, you know, legally uh, interacting with exchanges and possibly market makers. Some of the volatility, I think, in my own opinion at least, is that the, you know, the, the various crypto exchanges lack normal market makers you know, in the market. But have you thought uh, through yet about how would be the best way? Obviously, they need to, uh, I saw in the, you know, in the proposed rule, need to be a legitimate exchange, et cetera, but, but sort of in a mechanical way. Well, someone was talking to me about that today and, and suggested um, that it may be premature to assume that there's going to be a secondary market that's willing to take a nascent token and start trading it, and that some of that trading might have to happen elsewhere. I mean, some could happen outside the U.S., theoretically, but you can also imagine, and this, this person suggested, you really ought to think about um, whether some kind of decentralized exchange mechanism would be the right way to get that liquidity started, which then could later move on to um, an exchange, a more formal exchange with an intermediary that could then conduct the anti-money laundering and know your customer. So I think there are mechanical questions about how that, how that could get going. You know, uh, the, the issuer could also um, figure out a way to offer liquidity itself at the beginning. That's an option that um, we see certainly in the in the centralized, the ones that intend to say, stay centralized, they will, um, those two no action letters I mentioned, both of them offer liquidity um, themselves. So that's another way to get there. Yeah, the world freaked out last week because the Dow Jones was down like 15% in a week. Bitcoin easily makes that movement in a matter of hours. Um, how does uh, the commission think about, you were talking about liquidity, so it's not liquidity is obviously volatility, right? Um, how do you all think about volatility? And also, is there any way for, um, uh, what's the right term, a caveat emptor, someone engaging with an exchange, is there any way for them to know that the exchange, let's say, volumes are real, as we've seen a lot of exchanges from other countries have totally fake volumes. Um, are those issues that the Commission's concerned about, or is that something that, is there any sort of grading system or whatever that I could come in as a consumer and know that this exchange is more liquid and more robust than that exchange where the founder goes off and dies in India and no one knows where the money went and that sort of thing. Um, so if it's a if it's a Bitcoin spot market, um, it probably is not going to be within our purview. Um, and so we've we've thought about that issue in connection with the Bitcoin exchange traded product um, applications. People who, who have wanted to uh, list those kinds of products have run into questions from us about whether or not there, there's manipulation in the underlying markets. And it's, so there's been a lot of back and forth about that. I mean, what I would say is I think there's some really good general principles, which is if you're going to invest in an asset class, you, you should have some sense of what the volatility 
uh, profile is of that asset class, and if, if it's a volatile asset class, you should be prepared to see to see volatility. But if you're not prepared, maybe that's not the right asset class for you. Um, in terms of you know where you decide to do your transactions, again, um, that's something that. Look, if you want to engage in it in, a, in the securities markets, you know that you'll be transacting on a regulated platform, and so you can draw some comfort from that. But if you're if you're engaged in in an area where the where the exchanges aren't regulated in the way that um, securities exchanges are, then you should be asking questions about that. You should be thinking about that, and I think some of these really well well known failures of of um, Bitcoin platforms, exchange platforms have have caused people to ask more questions and be a bit more careful. So I think people have learned and, and um, you know not necessarily taking things on face value anymore. And I think that's healthy and that's something I always encourage people, no matter what you're doing with your money, to ask lots of questions, be skeptical. That's just that's just a good way of carrying out business, regardless of whether we're regulating the space or not. So, are would you say a Bitcoin ETF is more or less um, secure, or less volatile than, let's say, the underlying asset itself? I mean, I know there was some conversation on the Wilshire ETF and um, well, some of the act actions around that. I mean, I think it depends on how the Bitcoin ETP is designed, um, and and some people. Uh, We've seen a number of different applications for Bitcoin ETPs, and they've all been a bit different. And so, depending on how it's designed, you could you could design it to be more or less volatile, I suppose, than than uh, Bitcoin. I had a kind of unrelated, back to the safe harbor, but unrelated to the exchanges question uh, about disclosures. So, um, one of the required disclosures for the proposed rule is disclosing the holdings of the, um, you know, the, the management team, essentially promoter team, and then certain other holders. Um, but it, it's less precise, I guess, than for registrants. So one thing that we're trying to get a, a handle on, you know, sort of advising companies, is uh, whether you've given any thought to making that sort of like Section 16 officers, like for registered companies? Is it the founder and senior, you know, sort of the executive vice president equivalent? Or, you know, did you have something in mind about where you would cut that off? Just from a disclosure standpoint, thinking about the way we normally do tables, like in a, a publicly filed, um, you know, SEC file. Probably, I'm, I'm trying to think back to how we phrased it, but I think you could probably, um, Assume that it would be a, a similar type of, of level of person that we were looking for. You know, we're just, when you talk about your project, who is it you're saying is working on your project, right? You're saying, oh, we have so and so who's who's um, leading the project, and these three people are working with so and so. Well, if you're advertising to people like that, those are probably the ones that you would want to disclose. Um, but I think. Yeah, you could probably view it in much the same way you would view view it on the Section 16 side. I, I, we could provide more clarity. I mean, again, if people have thoughts on, on how to define that. Um, we just want to make sure, too, that that you're not, um, you know, excluding. We, we see this a lot in fraudulent <coughs> offerings where they'll exclude conveniently the person who has a rap sheet of securities fraud, and so they don't they don't mention that he's involved, and they give the other people. I want to avoid that kind of thing. Understood. <laughs> so stable coins are those securities? Are those assets? Are the, how do you all think about them? Especially considering, I think last count, uh, two three hundred of them, maybe more, are out there. And then as a follow on, would you consider? These asset-backed um, tokens, stable coins, I know there are ones out there that are backed by gold or backed by diamonds or silver, these sorts of hard assets. How does the commission think about stable coins and hard asset-backed tokens? Well, I think it depends, again. I think each one has to be judged on its own facts. But um, 
there are potential implications for the securities laws depending on how they're set up, and it could be um, <clears throat> that they might function like money market funds, so you'd have to think about that. Um, but I think it's it's not, they are in kind of a unique, um, they are a unique category, but at the same time, there's enough diversity within that unique category that I don't think I can give you one easy, simple answer, yes, they're all securities, or yes, they're all money market funds. Um, but certainly, if someone's planning to launch one of those things, you you want to think through those implications and probably come talk to the SEC among other regulators. I kind of think of them in three dimensions. So there's you know, the fiat-backed ones, which I, I would argue is a currency, I'm not sure. Um, and then there's the crypto-backed ones, which are Risky at best, but then you know, on the more interesting side, you know, there's the ones like Basis, right, where it's a completely synthetic mechanism to try to stabilize the coin. That the underlying mechanisms themselves are securities. Um, what do you think the future, future is for those? Well, I mean, again, I, I I don't know that I want to make a blanket statement. I think that that um, that's an interesting example that you cite, um, and I think it. it it's kind of a new creature, right? And so we we not only have to think about how do our how do we think about them as a securities regulator, but we have to work with our fellow um, federal financial regulators and try to figure out how they think of them, so that at least we can have some kind of consistency across across the government. And so I think that's more of a, a multi-regulator effort. I certainly don't speak for other financial regulators. And then also security tokens were the hot, hot thing a year and a half ago. It, it was the promise of lower costs, the ability to, in essence, create uh, a bond-like uh, mechanism and to not just distribute the assets, but also distribute governance. Governance and control by small investors was a, a key element for a lot of these um, products. Then something happened in the security token market it went cool because you had to hold security token for at least a year and there wasn't a whole lot of liquidity. Um, how do you think about security tokens? Is that um, a different thing? Is there a reason why that hasn't lived up to the promise of enabling the smaller investor to get a share of you know, real estate or own shares of other shares or that sort of thing? Well, I think some of that is still developing and you know, everyone's kind of cooled down a little bit from the initial hype of lots of things, right, and they're taking a step back. But I think we're going to see um, more tokenization um, across the board, both of traditional securities and of um, various asset-backed, uh, we'll have asset-backed tokens too. So I think we're going to see development of that, but it just, it takes some time and, and you know, in some, respect this isn't really anything new it's just a new maybe more convenient way of doing things that we've already done um, so I suspect that there's some infrastructure that's still gonna have to be built out but I my guess is that it's that's coming JJ how about you when when you're talking about um, some of the projects I was involved with related to real estate offshore real estate, uh, there was some conversation about outflows of currency from other countries that wanted to get into real estate, and where was that currency coming from? Are those issues that you all have dealt with in these asset back, maybe real estate sorts of things? Sure, we, you know, we look at the, the flows um, back and forth, but you know, I, I think the, the shine has really come off that, and I think you know, the big trend right now is uh, central bank digital currencies. Which we're starting to see, you know, China, Venezuela has been experimenting for a little while uh, with the help of the Russians. But you know, I think Libra really started the cryptocurrency arms race at the central bank level, and you know, I'm pretty sure we'll see most nations in the next decade or so launch their own cryptocurrencies. Uh, and the U.S. is considering it. They probably won't be first, but they will be strong. Would love your perspective on. Uh, government backed cryptocurrencies commission. Is that something that you're looking at? Well, I think um, it's, again, less of my issue than it is the Fed's issue, and the Fed has, has 
talked some about it, um, but I think other a lot of other central banks are are thinking about um, whether or not to go forward with the with the digital currency. And so the next few years should be an interesting time to see which ones decide to go forward and which not. Um, so I'm crypto mom, but um, crypto, there's a crypto dad too, and that's former chairman of the CFTC, and one of his projects now that he's working on is trying to think through um, a U.S. Cent um, central bank digital currency, and he's he's um, trying to think through some of the privacy implications uh, of that, which I think is a really important piece to think through beside before something like that launches. So the digital yuan will have, what's the term, Julio? Selective anonymity? Yes. Selective anonymity. Who gets to select? <laughs> so I mean, if you have a crypto mom and a crypto dad, and you have a bad crypto kid, would you name that bad crypto kid Libra? Okay, um, and oh, let me just make sure I get this right. Okay, can you comment on today's Treasury convenes cryptocurrency working sessions with industry leaders that they announced today? No, because I didn't even see the announcement. So, so Jay, do you want to? Uh, I cannot comment on that either. Oh, okay, Ken. I, I wasn't I wasn't aware until now either. So I'm more sorry. That's okay. it. Like I'm 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 on that one. Okay. So I mean, one thing that I hear a lot from entrepreneurs um, that makes me a little concerned is the willingness of entrepreneurs to do things and to basically use the the power of distributed ledgers to to solve problems, but at the same time. I think there's a lot of legitimate um, decision paralysis because, as you mentioned, you know, okay, you get a no action letter that's kind of like, well, you know, you kind of ran, you didn't really run the stop sign, but you know, like the, it's kind of like the, the the glass half empty sort of thing. Is there something that you think, or or what what sort of um, change or rule set or whatever do you think will provide enough clarity for entrepreneurs to go off and be like, okay, this is a clear lane and I'm going to go go for it for this sort of business. Because right now, my perception based on a lot of people I know, a lot of conversations um, I've had over the years is that people are driving with one foot on the brake as well, looking over their shoulder. Is there a way that the government in general or SEC in particular can provide you know, a little more clarity, like, hey, this white space is cool, go over there. Well, I hope so. I mean, I think we definitely have work to do to provide some clarity. And mostly what I hear is, please just, you know, we don't care if you have rules in this space, just tell us what they are and we'll comply with them. And so there are a number of areas. Custody is one. Um, this space that I was trying to address with the safe harbor is another. Um, the exchange space is another. Um, trying to figure out how how um, a, a, the crypto space interacts with our securities investor protection regime, our, our CIPA, which is basically our um, insurance, um, for lack of a, it's like the insurance scheme in the security space. So trying to figure out how all of those things work, I think are things we can do, and then trying to figure out what falls within the SEC's jurisdiction, what falls within the CFTC's jurisdiction. But those questions are even difficult on much more traditional types of products. Um, we are, we're always talking with the CFTC about what where those lines might be. So some of the frustration is unique to this space, but I will say some of the frustration just comes from the fact that we have a really complex federal and state um, regulatory scheme, and I, I, my guess is that that's not going to change anytime soon. So I think we can provide some clarity, but I don't know that we're going to get to the point where people feel like there are no questions um, that they need to hire lawyers to help them figure out. 
And you bring up a really interesting point about the states. So you think about Wyoming, you think about New York, you think about Puerto Rico, obviously not a state, but these different regimes that are, that are being enacted on the state level, how does that interplay work? Do they come to the SEC first and ask your opinion, or do they just do whatever they like New York? That are, you know, that's uh, interesting to me, the, the whole New York situation. Uh, I think the New York situation is interesting to a lot of people. Um, well, I think a lot of the, the um, I mean, we have a regulatory system that envisions a role for the states, and that includes both on the money transmission, um, there's that side, but then also on the security side, there are state securities regulators, and there's a whole system of state securities laws, which actually predates the, the federal securities laws. And we view them as very important partners with us in, in our work, and we're um, we work with them to prevent um, a lot of bad activity from happening. There, We view them as really important in that space. Um, but it can be very complicated, and there's sometimes times when we say, you know what, we as a federal regulator need to preempt the states. And so, for example, in the safe harbor, one, one piece that I wanted to build in there was preemption of state laws, because I think if we said, all right, we're, we're not going to treat these things like securities, um, and then the states came and said, ah, but we are, then it could end up being not as useful as it otherwise might be. And so that's one reason why state preemption seemed like a good idea. Um, but it, yeah, it's certainly going to continue to be a complicated um, landscape. I don't know if you have something to add on the, on the state side. Sure. I think, um, you know, they, the New York side is interesting in some ways. Um, you know, I think they were just advanced on some things and many uh, aspects of the people that are, are considered overreach, but you know, in reality, if you go back to the guy who supposedly died in India, uh, under the New York AG, that could have never happened, right? So there's some very basic controls. Never have died. <laughs> <laughs> who says he's dead? I, I'm just saying that under the, under the New York law, they would have had a backup system, they would have had disaster recovery, they would have had a proper chief information security officer, things that, you know, Anyone in this room would probably want if they're going to trust somebody with more than 10 bucks. Yeah, but he was Canadian, John. I'm half Canadian. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> that was the joke. Um, yeah, seriously. So, um, yeah, no, that, that is kind of crazy. So, speaking of um, crazy stuff, what level of criminality do you think really happens with Bitcoin? I mean, relative to dictators having containers filled with hundred dollar bills buried in their <laughs> like how big a problem is it you know it's one of those things that it's top of mind but I'm just kind of wondering I don't know John you probably see a lot of yeah, data yeah, floating around. We measure that right um, I, I would say that it, it, it's dependent really on the country and the level of regulation so in one study we found it was like 37 times higher in unregulated parts of the world than it is in regulated parts of the world like the US and Japan um, but the level of direct criminality between uh, people is in the sub-1% range, and in some parts of the world is 0.25%. So we're saying it, it's not nearly uh, as big of a problem as it's made out to be. I think it's the potential that really worries people, and it's, I think it's the potential of it moving very quickly without anyone seeing it uh, that creates the, the questions. Um, does the SEC measure um, <coughs> cryptocurrencies for badness or that sort of thing? I mean, you think about privacy coins out there, like, you know, let's just all like Monero. Like, the reason people, I think, would want Monero is they probably want to hide something. My hunch, I don't know. Do, does the SEC look at some of these different um, currencies and their use cases as more concerning than others? or? or some, you know, like Ethereum or Bitcoin, given their wide adoption in use cases getting more legitimized? Well, uh, we do try to stay in our lane, which is really to find out if someone's doing it, if someone's offer, making an offering and, and lying, right? That's gonna be a fraud action that we bring. And so it's more of that than 
looking to the underlying um, use of the coin and whether people are using it for illegitimate activities. I mean, I would say that I think one of the drivers behind people's interest in privacy coins is not necessarily that they're doing anything, want to do anything wrong. They just may not want other people to know how they spend their money, right? And so that's something that as a society we're struggling with trying to figure out how can we on the one hand um, apply our, our anti-money laundering regime, which is driven by legitimate concerns, and on the other hand, respect people's interest in having their transactions be private, which is also driven by legitimate concerns, and those are, those are things that are um, sometimes hard to balance, and hard to balance, in, in fact, not only in this space, but in other spaces where um, we, for example, have this program that we're kicking into gear, which is gonna monitor every tr securities transaction in the United States. And that is, um, you know, that's, that raises those same questions. On the one hand, we have a legitimate interest in trying to find problems in our securities markets. On the other hand, people have a legitimate interest in not having their regular watch over their shoulder as they engage in securities transactions. So those are um, really fundamental questions that I think we have to continually as a society be asking ourselves, um, where's the right balance? And I, I would say that as you know, crypto becomes more mainstream and we start to use it as true internet money, like, I believe most of us in this room will care a lot more about the privacy of those those transactions, right? And just because you know I've got a lot of cash in my pocket doesn't mean I'm about to buy my drugs off the street corner, right? I just don't want my credit card company to know everything I'm doing. Um, and so I think you know it will become critical, especially with central bank digital currencies. Um, particularly in countries like the U.S. where privacy is a fundamental right. Uh, so we're big proponents of that, and even with respect to the travel rule, uh, I'm collaborating with uh, all, all the major privacy coin vendors and chains to actually make sure they can comply. So Zcash has some interesting mechanisms around shielded and unshielded, uh, collaborating with the Monero team to help them be able to comply. You know, at the end of the day, Privacy coins are way, way, way less anonymous than cash. And that's what all the bad guys want, is green bags. So just like your notes, CJJ, when you think about the scope of bad stuff that goes down with Bitcoin, bad stuff that goes down with just paper money, what would your hunch be in terms of the difference in scope of scale? Multiple layers, multiple fact factors of orders of magnitude, more in cash. Cash is king. So, um, Commissioner, you've been incredibly generous with your time, and I just have one more question, and then we might take one or two from the audience, and we can have some drinks and do whatever. Um, you know, it kind of struck me in the whole social media um, testimony of the last year when uh, the different uh, executives from the big social media companies were being asked questions, and people were commenting that some of the Congress people asking questions didn't even know like the basics of like using email or didn't know the basics of functionality of social media. People had a chuckle about that. But back to John's point about orders of magnitude, the orders of magnitude of complexity around crypto, just so much greater. Um, you clearly are um, you know a beacon of light in the regulatory regime, having you know tremendous understanding of the whole thing, but. Your fellow people in Washington, how big a problem is that, do you think, that a bunch of people may not even understand the underlying what they're regulating? Is that a, something that people out here or building companies should be worried about? And if so, what's it going to take to bring at least a base level of understanding up amongst your other regulatory peers to make sure they don't, you know, maybe to no harm, so to speak. Well, it's difficult. I mean, it's difficult for people in Congress who are dealing with, I mean, they're extremely busy people and they're dealing with lots of different things. And so um, it's the same, I think, with us as regulators. We're dealing with a lot of different things and trying to figure out how, uh, not even how a new technology works, but, but well enough understand what it does so that we can figure out how to regulate it is is a really difficult thing and something i struggle with i try to take as much time as i can to learn about 
these things. I listen to lots of podcasts, try to get smarter on these things, but it's really hard. And, and I think it's not, it's, it's just a small piece of what I do. And there are a lot of other things I need to get smart on too. So my advice to people out here is, yeah, it really is probably helpful if you let, if you let uh, the Washington and your state regulators know kind of the basics of what you, of what your, what the technology is that you're working with. And, and that familiarity will, I think, breed better regulation. Um, you shouldn't expect them to know as much about it as you do. That's not their job, and you know that's why they're regulators, and 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 you're not. Um, you're doing the technology, but I think you can help them to get to a better place of just feeling comfortable enough that it's not as scary as it otherwise would be. Um, you know, I don't. You've spent some time getting to know this technology, and you know what it's like to be a securities lawyer at the SEC. So. What's your advice to us? You, you know, my, my advice is, um, you know, to continue doing what you're doing for, you know, the members of the staff or Congress. I mean, really, literally, you know, doing little roadshows where you're educating about the basics, including just the standard, you know, glossary of vocabulary. But it's like any industry, when you don't understand it, you quickly can get confused and think someone is doing something illegal or failing to disclose. And and I I found this area fascinating because uh, you know I had to learn everything from square one and still I'm learning. And then you can put it in context. So um, to me, you know, I don't know how this would actually work, but uh, having some sort of tutorials for you know those in the government. Um, who at least are interested with their needs to try to bring them up to speed, you know, on the area would seem helpful. Um, and it's just one of many disruptive technologies. It's an amazing time in our society. You know, we have artificial intelligence, we have uh, cryptocurrency, you know, all sorts of, you know, DeFi going on. Um, and I think it's, you know, the next wave and, and, and people really need to dig in and understand it. But, um, I don't know what kind of mechanism or, you know, obviously, you know, dealing with Congress with certain limitations, but, um, you know, maybe having more education tutorials. Um, and it's unfortunate, by the way, you mentioned the hearings. Um, it was, you know, in many ways, I think, a real letdown because I think the folks in Congress both didn't understand what they were asking, but then people you know, presenting, it was a clear disconnect. So I think it was an education moment, and it just didn't happen. So. Sure, I, and I would, you know, jump on what you said about the rubbish shows. So don't yell from the West Coast and expect to be heard. You know, I think, <laughs> just seriously, don't, don't do that. You, you need to actually go to DC, you need to get involved, visit them. We spend time uh, educating Congress and Senate on a regular basis. We're involved with the Digital Chamber of Commerce and other industry groups like the Blockchain Alliance. And really, you need to think of part of your mission, and not just with the government, with everyone out in the whole world. If we want to grow this space, part of our mission is education. And we need to educate everyone about crypto, about how clean it can be, how effective it is, and how it changes the world. Yeah, and to add to that, JJ, I mean, I'm really impressed with what you all are doing with your university program, right? Sure, sure let me help. Should do a little shout out for the Defenders League. So, um, you know, given under the nature of business that we do forensic uh, investigations on Bitcoin crimes, we get a lot of inbound. So, as an enterprise software company, we really can't go out and solve those ourselves. So, what we've done is we've launched what we call the Secretary's Defenders League, which is a group of students that are trained. So, we also, we also offer certification. So, we can certify somebody to be a certified cryptocurrency examiner in a day. and. Uh, what we're doing is we're equipping, equipping these schools and these students uh, with the education and the tools to actually solve these crimes. So, you know, we fraud crimes, stop crimes, uh, thefts, um, romance schemes, and we're teaching these people how to solve these crimes. So the school that, that Julio, who's on my staff, comes from, specializes in financial crime management. So we're training 30 students uh, from his school later this month, and they're going to go out and solve crimes. That's, that's pretty awesome. Um, so let's just give a hand to the commissioner and our panel. Uh,
question? No. It's, uh, um, I'll say, yes, you with the uh, purple check. Uh, cool. Um, thank you so much. I mean, I really appreciate that what happened with this dialogue here. You know, you, you represent the government indirectly, but you still come here and you talk to us and you share your thoughts. So I think it's awesome. Um, so my question is more around, so if we look at the crypto economic revolution from a historical perspective, it's quite, what's quite unique is that now you have capital and community combining unique incentives to uh, create different structures that are very different from the type of security law that was invented to address the joint stock company, which was invented all the way back right in the, in the 17th century. Um, and given now that we have these different incentives, um, how are we ought to think about this? Because you know now there's DAOs, uh, after the DAO hack, it's been many years, there's uh, foundations that have been created that think about dis dismantling their uh, foundation to create a pure DAO. And I think the future is really networks, not companies, where you know these young kids work, I'm oh, sorry, too much, too much talk, yeah. Um, so my question, I suppose, is just like, how do you think about uh, the entrepreneurs sort of forging ahead in that landscape where they're building networks and they want to do the right thing, um, you know, how are you supposed to communicate with the government? How are you supposed to like think about these things uh, where, there, where there's so many unknowns in this sort of landscape? Well, you raised some interesting questions about um, how law will need to evolve to account for a, a new way of organizing people to do things together, which, you know, we've had the corporation, which is really effective, and I think it's not going to go away because it's really effective at organizing people to achieve a common purpose together. But I think decentralized networks will also be a way to do that, and I think a pretty powerful way. Um, and so it raises lots of interesting questions for how laws apply to those kinds of networks, because then no one is really responsible for things in the same way that a corporation is. Um, some of those questions are really beyond the SEC, uh, the SEC's purview, because they're more you know, corporations are creatures of state law, and so and they're governed by state law. Uh, and so decentralized networks are, you know, maybe not within really our, our realm in terms of, um, you know, they, they don't fit neatly into any framework, right? But I will say that in terms of connecting with the government and, and working with the government, there are lots of ways to do that. We have, you just go to the SEC's website, go to FinHub, and you can connect with us and, um, the people in, who work in FinHub travel to different cities and you can go talk to them about what you're trying to do. And they won't give you legal advice, but they will point you in the right direction to some things that you should be thinking about. Um, so there are these these um, ways of, and you can always talk to me, you can give me a call, send me an email, drop by my office if you're in DC. Um, although I, I'm, you know, if you've got technical questions, I recommend that you talk to the staff, but you're always welcome to come talk to me as well. So, I mean, I think we're all gonna be working through this together, and I think there are a lot of interesting things for all of us to learn and think about, um, but there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Hi, um, my name is Maya. Thank you so much for spending time with us. It's very inspiring. Um, in San Francisco. My question, uh, I have two quick questions. One, um, what do you think you have done for after first uh, leg A plus in Brock stock last summer? Um, I'm talking about more about like, impact for our lives. A second question I have is, what are you envisioning uh, moving forward in terms of regulating this uh, cryptocurrency, for instance, now we can measure uh, climate ex uh, climate change or our behavior in like retail supply chain, airplane uh, industry. We can make so many impact in all different industries. So, what do you think you can make impact the most? So on the first question on Reg A+, plus, um, I mean, I think that, that, I'm not sure if your question was around what what's coming in the future with respect to um, Reg A+, plus, but I think others saw that it, it is one mechanism to use, and so I expect that others will try to use that mechanism as well. Um, you know, the, their, their 
um, are lots of people who are interested in that as a particular way to get um, tokens out uh, and, and to do a token offering. On the second question, um, you know, I think that the use cases that you suggested are some of the things that can be really powerful in trying to help explain to regulators why it's important to build a regulatory framework that works because there really are some things that I think are uniquely able to be accomplished using um, token networks that may be much harder to do in other ways. And so to the extent that we can show people these use cases and say, hey, you know, this is something that we can make a difference um, on climate issues in a, in, in a way that we couldn't do with more standard securities um, offerings, that may be a way to convince some people that it's, it's worth spending some more time thinking about developing a regulatory framework that works. You know, there has been some, um, actually a lot of talk in the crypto world because crypto, the original idea was it's going to democratize people's ability to engage and fund companies, right? The whole ICO thing before it got out of hand was really a democratized participation vehicle, but yet that keeps bumping into the whole qualified investor challenge. And a friend of mine uh, who's a big investor said, you know when last time I checked, there's no correlation between intelligence and your bank account. Um, so, I, I, you know, there are a lot of places, a lot of people you know that want to participate in these things in the same way they do and on crowdfunding sites. Do you see this whole qualified investor regime changing, maybe in general or specifically as it relates to crypto investments? We do have a proposal out now that asks for comment on whether the accredited investor regime should change. Um, it proposes some, some modest changes and um, asks some questions about maybe more uh, broader changes that would open that would open up accredited investor status to a wider range of individuals. You know, personally, I agree with your friend that um, that the correlation um, that we use, which is supposed to be it's a rough proxy, sophistication, wealth, wealth and income are being used as a rough proxy for sophistication, and certainly doesn't always work that way. Um, I go back to my liberty concerns, right? People work really hard to earn their money, and then we place constraints on how they can spend it. Um, and and I, I have fundamental problems with that, but that's that's a deeper problem in our securities laws, and it's one um, that you know we may make some progress opening up the accredited investor definition. I doubt we're going to have a radical shift because there's no KYC regime in casinos in Vegas, right? So any bozo can show up there and blow their whole retirement fund if that's what they want to do. So I mean, yeah. if I want to blow all my money on investing in uh, you know, Webvan or XYZ coin, why can't I, right? Well, I, I fully agree with you, and then when you lose all your money, don't come crying to me. So I tell you, hey, I told you that you can do whatever you want with your money, but I didn't tell you I'd be a backstop when you lost it all. So I think we have to, we've got to marry those two concepts together, but I'm certainly open to that. The, the problem is that, um, you know, we have to also look at what practical reality is and, and the reason that people have those like the accredited investor framework is because it, it's a view that it's a way to make sure that people don't get really badly hurt. So we have to think about how, again, we can balance those, the desire to protect people and the desire to protect their ability to invest. And um, they're, that's what we're sorting through now in this proposal that's out there. That's great. That's on the table. I'll one final question, Alex. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Actually, I was going in that direction, so I'll, I'll pivot away from there. But um, thank you to the entire uh, panel here, and especially Commissioner, for um, coming to this evening. And also thank you for your service to the country. Um, I think we all appreciate that very much. Um, so since we already just talked about kind of accredited investors, uh, one thing I'll say on that is that um, I, I think I agree with you in, in the sense that um, by and large we would all agree that the SEC was formed and under the premise of protecting the little guy or gal. Um, and I think it's important that we understand that protection not only means protection from fraud or um, bad actors, but also protection from 
barriers to entry and opportunities, and um, we should be cognizant of how laws have been written in the past that um, are presenting certain barriers to the access that, say, um, a generation or two ago, people were able to invest in uh, early stage companies, high growth companies, um, that now have been uh, pretty much sidelined and only reserved for those that have the capital resources and legal resources to participate. Anyway, so I'm gonna go back to- I think that you put it really beautifully. I mean, I think that is exactly the, the point I'm always trying to drive home to my colleagues, which is you can't think of investor protection as just protecting investors from hurting themselves. You really have to think about it from the perspective of are we putting up these barriers to them because that hurts them too. So opening opportunities is part of investor protection. Absolutely. So to my question, um, uh, it kind of goes back to the, the sandbox um, moniker. And as we know, a lot of countries out there are using this uh, term as a, as a sandbox and creating frameworks. Um, I can't think of one sandbox that the US government has ever put out in any of the uh, bodies out there. And so I just don't think that the US government thinks about playing sandboxes. Um, but with all the proposals that are being put out um, by individual uh, contributors, commissioners, and what have you, and requests for comments, are we moving towards a regulatory framework that at some point there is going to be something that is a little bit more of a, uh, a sandbox? <laughs> um, or is it going to continue to be a patchwork and piecemeal, you know, tidbit by tidbit thing, and that's just what we need to get used to and, and accept? Or, or is it, are things starting to gel, and are we getting closer to something where um, maybe the floodgates will sort of start to open a little bit? I'm asking your personal opinion. Well, Thank you. You know, I'm optimistic that we can make progress, but I'm not, I've not historically been such a huge fan of sandboxes. Um, I like beaches where people can do what they want to do without having a lifeguard sitting right in the sandbox with them, right? You know, the lifeguard is sitting there watching what you're doing but not micromanaging you. And I worry that when you set up regulatory sandboxes, and it does depend how they're organized, and that term is used pretty broadly, so um, some people have even described my safe harbor proposal as being a sort of sandbox, which I can kind of see. But I do want to make sure that we don't set up a system where the regulator has to be so involved in managing every step of a project that the project becomes something different than it was intended to be. Um, but to your broader point, I think we are making progress. I think most progress in the securities laws is incremental. It's not like a dramatic change from one day to the next. Um, you know, the Jobs Act is maybe one example of where it was a pretty dramatic change and it happened pretty fast. But even there, the, the Jobs Act went into place and then it took quite a while for the rules to get in place. And those rules, you know, they they added some requirements along the way too. So so you just sort of see things being much more incremental and you've got to work on things in an incremental way. But you know, again, if you all have suggestions of big changes that we should be making, send those my way too. I'm always open um, to thinking about the big ideas as well. And on that note, a big hand for the commissioner. Thank you.